Hello, everyone. Welcome to another one of our SVM's Lunchtime Star Seminar Series. Today, we will have a presentation by Dr. Deepan Kishore. I would now like to hand you over to our director, Dr. Georges, to introduce our guest speaker today. Please welcome Dr. Georges. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. And a special, of course, good afternoon to Dr. Deepan Kishore our guest lecture today. So Dr. Kishore is, um, Kishore is a director of research and head of surgery, Neil Veterinary Hospital. His interests are soft tissue, orthopedic uh, surgery and integrative medicine. He is a former student of our own Dr. Ganesh and he graduated from Madras Veterinary College in 2007 and he did an MS at the University of Missouri in Columbia in 2010. His, um, he has a broad range of interests. He's also very involved in assisting students. Of course, he does quite a lot of work in hyperbaric, hyperbaric therapy in small animal practice. So without further ado, I just want to introduce you to Dr. Deepan Kishore. Welcome. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I'm Dr. Kishore, and I'm here to talk to you about hyperbaric oxygen therapy in small animal practice. Like I said, I, I work in a uh, emergency specialty practice in Oklahoma City. Um, our, our interests are, you know, we do a wide variety of procedures here, mostly small animals and exotic medicine as well. And we use hyperbaric therapy as an integrative uh, medicine. You know, we just go in and treat the patients like we normally treat them and add in hyperbaric as an integrative option. So we'll move to the next slide. So what is hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a medical treatment that applies oxygen under pressure. So those are the two most important terms. I mean, if you're a student listening to this, two things you'll get is hyperbaric therapy is 100% oxygen given under a lot of pressure, usually 1.5 to three times of normal atmospheric pressure. Treatments generally last approximately about an hour. Most times we do one to two treatments a, a day. Uh, you could do more as long as there's about a four hour gap between sessions. Most patients do not require any sedation, but you know there's always that odd fractious dog and you may have to uh, sedate them uh, to get them into the chamber. There is not a set protocol. A lot of work is still being done with hyperbaric therapy. There is not a set um, number of treatments that you'll do for a specific disease process. I mean, it's based on experience and usually response to therapy. So, I mean, of course, a picture explains uh, what happens much better than I can. So here's an empty hyperbaric therapy chamber and a one with a pet. I'm not getting paid by any company to tell you it works or it doesn't, but this is the chamber that we use. It's the Seacrest chamber. And the nice thing about this chamber is you can literally talk to a patient. You can pick up the phone that's there and tell the pet to calm down if it's really excited or the owners can talk to them. That really helps. And another big benefit of this chamber is you can use this you can pass IV lines through the chamber and help pets that are not very stable to stay in the chamber. It needs to be in a very well ventilated area. And of course it's 100% oxygen. So you don't want anything that can set off a fire or an accident. So what is hyperbaric medicine? Is it voodoo medicine? Does it have any science behind that? Does it work? Does it not work? Well, we have done about 3,000 treatments in this hospital, mostly as an integrative treatment. And I want to explain the physics that's behind hyperbaric therapy. 
So at room air, oxygen is about 21% and uh, at, at 188 are, are absolute atmospheres, what they call it. In a healthy animal, hemoglobin saturation is greater than 90% and plasma oxygen concentration is about 0.3 mils per deciliters. Henry's law, like we all know, say, states that solubility is proportional to pressure. Okay, so increase in atmospheric concentration of oxygen proportionally increases plasma oxygen concentration. That's the most, like I said, pressure and oxygen. Those are the mo two most important things with hyperbaric therapy. So when you increase the plasma oxygen concentration can go up fivefold with 100% oxygen at 180A. And it can go up tenfold uh, with 100% oxygen at 288, you know. So just increasing the pressure from one to two, it causes a tenfold increase in the oxygen concentration. And that's what we do with hyperbaric therapy. You can control the pressures within the chamber and that will help you determine how much concentration the pet, uh, of oxygen the pet is going to get. At 100% oxygen, at 380A, you know, the plasma oxygen concentration from 0.3 mils per deciliters in a normal pet goes to six mils per deciliter. So that's a deciliter squared. That's a very, very pronounced increase. This is high enough to meet all cellular mitochondrial requirements without any oxygen bound to hemoglobin, which is great. I mean, which you can use to treat cases with acute blood loss, for example, you have a dog come with IMHA, really low on hemoglobin. You put them in the chamber, you'll, they'll be literally walking around. It's pretty amazing to uh, see that. And this is nothing new. In 1960, Dr. Burema used hyperbaric therapy to keep exsanguinated pigs alive. And it was famously called the life without blood study. He put them in the hyperbaric chambers so they could survive without any hemoglobin. So that's how uh, of a rapid response, sometimes you can see if they go in the chamber. Next uh, principle or uh, law of physics would be increased gas diffusion with, uh, with increasing partial pressure differences. This is another um, uh, law of physics the hyperbaric uh, therapy uses. So high levels of oxygen dissolved in plasma can diffuse four times faster into microcirculation than oxygen transported by red blood cells. So this principle helps hyperbaric therapy deliver oxygen to very thick and edematous inflamed tissue. So that's when, when you don't have, when you have pulsing vessels that are going there, you really don't need hyperbaric. But when you have these vessels that are not well perfused and you could use every bit of microcirculation to get more cells, um, to cause the tissues to heal and more oxygen to those, that's when hyperbaric kicks in and, and helps. So uh, what's the pathophysiology? You know, hyperbaric therapy has two effects, a primary effect and a secondary effect. You know, like I said, same thing. One is mechanical effects of pressure and oxygenation of plasma. These are the two more imp important primary effects. There's other laws that come into play as well, like Boyle's law and increasing pressure cause the volume of gas, like the volume of the gas to decrease. And Henry's law, we have already discussed, you know, increased pressure, increases solubility of gas. You know, this can be used uh, to remove of certain, removal of certain gases. And these effects are combined uh, to treat decompression sickness and gas emboli and some of those are actually used in people more than in dogs. So the question is, why use hyperbaric therapy? You know, uh, delivering oxygen under high concentrations and pressure offers accelerated and, uh, and inflammatory properties that are just not possible under normal physiologic conditions. And other really nice thing about hyperbaric therapy is the oxygen levels remain elevated for about an hour after therapy. And this is, uh, those effects are lasting. So some of these cases, it's very, very helpful. Um, and carbon monoxide toxicity used to be a big deal before with better uh, systems and better housing systems. We don't see it as often. And they come with carbon monoxide toxicity, 
uh, hyper uh, oxygenation, hyperbaric therapy will be the treatment of choice. It can also be used, like I said, in severe anemia, failed grafts and everything like that. Uh, in carbon monoxide toxicity, you know, oxygen tension releases carbon monoxide from hemoglobin, and that in turn prevents oxidative stress, stress to the uh, mitochondria. So those are all primary effects of hyperbaric therapy, pressure and oxygen. So what are the secondary effects? So number one would be vasoconstriction. So hyperbaric therapy causes vasoconstriction by increased oxidation. Uh, and when that happens in the endothelium, it affects xanthine oxidase and prostaglandins. So that can cause uh, a pretty a pronounced vasoconstriction, you know. And this can help uh, when arterial vasoconstriction happens, there is less tissue edema and increased oxygen delivery to damaged tissues, okay? And cellular energy is retained and mitochondrial functions are also maintained. So uh, if you think about this, how does it apply? What conditions can we use this to? So uh, when it decreases tissue edema, it can usually be used to prevent fluid shifts within cavities, you know, crush injuries, compartment syndrome, ischemias, and reimplantation. Uh, those are the conditions where this vasoconstriction uh, helps. You know, there's some people that believe that uh, at least in several papers out of Asia. I mean, there's talk about uh, using pancreatitis and also help decrease bleeding. I'm not sure the effects are that pronounced to stop bleeding. So I wouldn't necessarily put a bleeding pet in hyperbaric therapy and expect that to stop. You know, this is more um, to help with the physiology than with any acute process. Uh, the other secondary effect of hyperbaric therapy would be wound healing, you know. Um, so there are studies have shown Hyperbaric therapy can uh, decrease pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. Like we know, inflammation is a balance. I mean, if you don't do anything, it's a problem. If you do a whole lot, I mean, that's another problem too. So it's a delicate balance, but a research has shown that it prevents adhesions of um, inflammatory cells to vasculature. So we don't cause leaky vessels, you know. And uh, it is believed uh, that hyperbaric therapy releases reactive nitrogen species, which decreases beta to integrins and in turn hampers adhesions of inflammatory cells to vasculature. So that's, that's good and that can prevent inflammation. Hyperbaric therapy health has antimicrobial and antifungal effects, you know. So one simple thing is it's not it's simple. I mean, anaerobic bacteria don't survive in oxygen. So if you get anaerobic bacteria out there causing infections and you get used to principles, you get high enough oxygen, well, that's going to kill the anaerobic bacteria. They've also proposed different, different mechanisms for antifungal effects. Uh, but the most important would be, you know, phagocytosis is, you know, it's, it's a high energy process. That's when, when we are sick, when there's own healing, pets don't feel normal because there is increased uptake of bacteria. Uh, and that's what's used. And the free radicals use that to kill bacteria. And some studies have shown there's up to a 40% increase uh, in oxygen usage when there is active phagocytosis going on. These are all in vivo studies just showing. So uh, in theory, if you go and supplement oxygen, that will go and improve the process of phagocytosis as well. So some studies have shown that hyperbaric therapy improves functionality of macrophages. Uh, all of these would contribute to uh, own healing, you know. And um, hyperbaric therapy, some antibiotics, you know, aminoglycoside, fluoroquinolones, uh, some of these antibacterial drugs seem um, to act be better when they have higher oxygen concentrations are combined with hyperbaric therapy. So like I said, if you have an open own, the way I would approach it as an integrative approach, you know, meaning, well, you got to respect surgery. We'll do your surgery, do your surgical debridement, culture. And when you had hyperbaric therapy, it's a great integrative option because it potentiates your antibiotics, your treatment plan, and that's how I use it, as an integrative option and very rarely as a sole therapy. So the next thing is neovascularization. You know, 
Hyperbaric therapy helps with angiogenesis and vasculogenesis. Well, little difference. Angiogenesis is new vessels coming out of existing vessels. Uh, vasculogenesis is when you actually go uh, and act at the stem cell level. So vasotelial endothelial growth, vascular endothelial growth factor, uh, platelet-derived growth factors, and fibroblast growth factors, they all help with new blood, for, blood vessel formation. And it's believed that hyperbaric therapy uh, potentiates uh, this effect. And studies have also shown an increased CD4 stem cells uh, in, uh, in pets that have been treated with hyperbaric therapy. And these are directly from the bone marrow. And this could uh, definitely have a very positive effect on healing. You know? And reperfusion injury is another area of interest at least in the US, and I know several places across Asia use hyperbaric therapy to uh, treat type two discs in people. And uh, there's a lot of people, I mean, it, I've talked to people in my gym, they'd be like, oh, this is the best thing. You go into the hyperbaric therapy, you don't feel any pain, it's it's all amazing. And, and, and they think it's just the best thing ever. Uh, I'm not sure if those effects have been demonstrated with research in pets, but again, I do use it um, uh, after my hemilaminectomies, we will, uh, before and after, treat them with hyperbaric, hopefully to prevent any free radical damage to spinal cord and everything. So how does it happen? Uh, it prevents lipid peroxidation of cell membranes. Uh, it prevents hyperbaric therapy, prevents conversion of xanthine dehydrogenase to xanthine oxidase. That's a vital step in lipid peroxidation, you know, and um, they've tried different types of experiments, the mice and rat models, and they've proved positive effects uh, of hyperbaric therapy uh, in preventing uh, reperfusion injuries. Uh, venomous bite wounds. So if you really put all of these pieces together, uh, when you're talking about bite wounds, you immediately have swelling. If you've seen snake bites, I mean, the face swells up. So, uh, our hospital participates with another vet school in the United States to assess benefits of hyperbaric therapy in Biden's. We haven't published anything yet. That's an ongoing study. And we have a lot of copperheads in this area. So uh, we are trying to see if hyperbaric, if we can demonstrate effects of hyperbaric uh, in these uh, snake bite wounds. Previously, rabbit model has been used to study brown recluse venom. And uh, when they were treated with hyperbaric therapy BID for seven days at 2ATA, for about 60 minutes or so, they definitely saw some positive effects. And in two weeks, they could see uh, re-epithelialization in treated tissues. So necrotizing wounds, thermal burns, again, you kind of just put all of these things that I said before, you know, it enhances growth factors, stem cell progenitor mobilization, the CD34s, and neovascularization. So when all of these are combined, when you know when new blood vessels are growing in, you have improved oxygen delivery, uh, stimulating collagen and fibrovas production. So uh, studies in the rat model have also shown enhanced oxygen delivery for weeks after treatment with hyperbaric therapy. And with wounds, and again, like I said, I'm just here to give you what uh, my experience is, what the research says. They published a recent study in the Journal of Veterinary Surgery, but they couldn't definitely prove that hyperbaric therapy had any additional benefits in wound healing. That's why some of these studies have gone back and forth. Some say it works really well. Others say it doesn't help. And I believe, I mean, it depends on how you uh, structure the study and what factors you're looking on. Uh, up and what your controls are. So a lot of things factor into how hyperbaric, how these results of the studies come up. And bone healing, uh, studying the mice model actually showed improved osteoblasts at fracture site. Uh, so fracture healing with reduced inflammation, increased osteocyte formation uh, was also demonstrated in the rabbit model. Uh, I think they tried that in the rabbit tibia bone, if I'm not mistaken. And beagles uh, were treated with H-spot after transplantation to treat cleft palates. And they actually showed very significant increase in bone mineral density in treated groups. You know, So in, in, the, in bone healing, when you think if you have an osteomyelitis, 
one, if it, it brings in a new osteoblast, that might be helpful. And those antimicrobial effects would be helpful as well. If, if I have osteomyelitis, yes, I would treat, use hyperbaric therapy. Like I said, I would still follow principles, culture, remove the implants if necessary. If you are to put in more grafts, go ahead and do that. And then hyperbaric would be a great addition. At least that's how I use it. So going through this really quick, I'm just going to summarize what the indications are for hyperbaric therapy. Pancreatitis has been studied pretty extensively in people. And there's even some papers that came out of uh, some vet schools in Asia where pancreatitis, uh, they've studied C-reactive proteins and they monitored C-reactive protein and how uh, when it, it, it can be used to treat and monitor response to pancreatitis. So again, it might be a great adjuvant option, but not a sole therapy. Some of these things, head trauma, spinal trauma, smoke inhalation, FCEs, those are all uh, conditions that could be a supplemental therapy to other rehab or other options they're using. Snake bite trauma, thermal burns. I've definitely seen some pretty good uh, effects with thermal burns, sepsis, strangulations, and non-cardiogenic uh, edema. You know, And uh, we do use it with soft palate surgery. I mean, we know with brachycephalics, every bit of oxygen helps. So we kind of treat, pre-treat them with hyperbaric, do the procedure, and then treat them again with hyperbaric uh, just to give us better odds with the surgery. And not, not, none of that has been published or anything. That's just personal experience. Uh, other things we've already discussed before. So what are, now we have talked about all the indications. When do you not use hyperbaric therapy? When you're running a fever, well, it, it, I would avoid hyperbaric therapy we all know it causes vasoconstriction. So you definitely do not want a dog to go in the hyperbaric chamber when it's running a fever. Second thing, probably the most important condition where I would avoid hyperbaric therapy would be pneumothorax. If you think about it, pneumothorax is air leaking from the lungs and we don't want to make it worse by pumping in more oxygen under high pressure. Things will definitely get worse. Pneumomediastinum, of course, avoid that as well. Well, we're dealing with 100% oxygen. So, I mean, needless to say, you got to stay away from alcohol and petroleum-based products. Um, you know, there, there are some, uh, there's some evidence that hyperbaric therapy or oxygen toxicity can cause seizure disorders. So I would not put any dog with a history of seizures or some condition that could potentially cause seizures um, on the hyperbaric chamber. For 3,000 plus treatments, I think I can think of one dog that may have had but the text stand right there that was immediately decompressed and got out of the chamber. That's the one case I can think of that we experienced uh, uh, a dog potentially having seizures. I mean, they, of course, recommend avoiding chemotherapy. The use of hyperbaric therapy in um, to, with patients with cancer, it's, it's, it's a very touchy subject because it causes angiogenesis and vasculogenesis, and uh, it is possible that it could spread it to other areas. So I avoid hyperbaric if there's a cancer situation, you know. And what other precautions? Previously, hypoglycemia was a big no-no for hyperbaric therapy, but the newer chambers have options, like I mentioned before, to administer dextrose during the treatment. So I think if you can administer IV dextrose, it's still okay. There is always a dog that will not listen to what you tell them. Uh, some dogs are very claustrophobic. If you can give mild sedation and manage the pet in the chamber, great, go ahead and do it. But if this dog is just throwing a fit and would not just rolling and no, that probably isn't a candidate for hyperbaric therapy. We have already talked about oxygen therapy and the risk for chamber uh, seizures. So we have staff that monitor pets throughout the treatment. There'll be one nurse right next to the pet trained hyperbaric certified nurse right next to the pet uh, monitoring the treatment. Other precautions, you know, you got to keep the humidity between 25 to 35 percent. This would prevent any static buildup within the chambers. So 
that's just more comfortable for the pets. Do not uh, put any pets with pneumothorax, undersol, GDV, or otic disease, anything with barotrauma in the hyperbaric chamber either. So if you install, I mean, price-wise, um, I think this is about a $100,000 chamber and um, probably cost another sixty dollars to $80,000 for installation and, 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 main, and that type of stuff. That's at least in the US. It could be different in different parts of the world. You could do your own research, but I would use a consultant if you're going to ins install because it, it is a very delicate process. There's a lot of regulations for this. You got to have so much space. There have been reports of pretty uh, serious uh, accidents with hyperbaric therapy. So you got to follow the NFPA 99 regulations and your local municipal codes for chamber operations, oxygen delivery, and that type of stuff. So that's very important. Uh, and that was a talk by itself as far as how you get it done. And I think for students, it's, it's probably going to be really boring if you talk about all the lo local regulations. So, um, so 100%, I mean, you need a tank uh, conversion to 100% liquid oxygen. Uh, you got to in, install this bulk tank um, outside your facility where there's free air. Of course, you got to make sure uh, there's no houses nearby because a big truck may have to come in to load oxygen. So there's going to be a lot of work and so you, you need some technical support for that. Personal trainings. I think the Hyperbaric Society now offers several safety training and emergency procedures uh, protocols. Uh, that's very important because in the event of an adverse event, if you're trained, then you really know what to do. You know, so uh, you, the nurses can also get, they can become certified hyperbaric uh, nurse uh, technicians. So that way, uh, that's a nice little uh, addition to if they're trying to improve in their careers. And it's also uh, gives a whole lot of safety when we offer these procedures, fee structure, treatments, of course, that's something management will have to decide on. Uh, scheduling treatments and time management is very important along with medical management, because if you have to do this twice a day or three times a day, you'll have to train personnel uh, so you can offer treatments 24 hours a day. So that's something we got to keep in mind as well. Um, I'll, I'll go through this slide really uh, soon as far as how we use this. Let's say a pet is hospitalizing, a hospitalized in, for, in the hospital for pancreatitis. We would use two to four hyperbaric treatments you know, to decrease inflammation, that type of stuff. We do see that uh, patients sometimes return to uh, normal uh, function a lot sooner. Orthopedic surgeries, I would either do a hyperbaric right before a TPLO or two sessions after, again, with a goal of swelling, uh, decreasing swelling. Like I said, if I do a TPLO, we'd scope the dog, do surgery. I'm not going to treat a cruciate repair with just hyperbaric therapy. Do the surgery. We do water treadmill. We would do other rehab options. This is just, again, a nice integrative option. Traumatic injuries, again, two to 10 sessions. IVDD uh, for, for hemilaminectomies, I'm a little bit more aggressive. I would treat twice a day for um, three to four days along with acupuncture and laser and that type of stuff. And we do believe that it, it speeds up like anecdotal. I would, uh, I would say it speeds up recovery after spinal surgeries. Thermal burns, they usually need a lot more time because the healing process is slower. We have had dogs referred from different parts of the state for thermal burns. And I would say we've had some really good luck treating thermal burns. And one such case would be Jamaica. You know, this a pit bull terrier was present with, th uh, with thermal burns, was on a house fire. This was back in 2018. Um, came in, and you can see the pictures. Like you all know, when you first day you look at the thermal burns, you think, hey, it's really not bad, just a couple of patches. And then we started treating with IV fluids and, and this pet in particular was very Jamaica, was very aggressive, did not like men. And we, of course, uh, probably very startled with the recent house fire, does not trust anyone. So days go by, like you can see slowly the skin start to slow off and we are still treating with antibiotics and pain medications to prevent infections. Uh, slowly as the day's progress, the thing goes. And this is 
like really bad. So all we are doing at this point is uh, uh, they're uh, Jamaica's boarding with us. We are doing twice a day uh, hyperbaric therapy. I mean, he really quickly learned uh, to get on the once he got felt comfortable in the hyperbaric therapy. Uh, we had several videos of that how he would fight to start with. And like a week to 10 days in, he would literally just get up and go into the hyperbaric chamber because he feels so comfortable and was more trusting of us. And then we sedated, like I said, always follow good surgical practices, medical practices. We debrided the wound. You can see with the pictures that it's starting to heal. And now uh, you have a much, I mean, um, way days down the line, you see a whole bunch of tissues contracting down. We did not do any flaps. Like you said, this dog's entire body is burned up. There's not enough skin to do flaps anywhere. This is just one side. The other side looks just as bad. And uh, several treatments later, uh, there's only a very small patch that was reunion day with the owner. And Jamaica was finally released after four weeks of hospitalization and 40 hyperbaric therapies. I mean, that's literally completely closed. And uh, I, like I said, we have treated uh, several pets with uh, thermal burns. And I would say that's one real good indication for that. And this is with Jamaica 3 2018 uh, with the wounds almost completely closed up. So this is another case that I have. And, and this would probably show you what exactly I mean. I mean. It's really hard to demonstrate some effects. So this is a very young dog. The first picture you see, you see a large mass in the oral cavity, like a four and a half year old dog. It, in a normal circumstance, I would have just went ahead and did a maxillectomy to remove uh, this mass. So being a young dog, like it, this is a different school uh, with an amazing faculty, we participate in some cancer research. So they reached out and they wanted to do thermal ablations. Anyone with experience with radiation would know that mucositis, you know, the mucous membranes either, either in the oral cavity or in your gut can get inflamed and it's called as mucositis, which is usually an effect of radiation. We did not use radiation, but we used thermal energy to completely ablate this mass, hoping to avoid surgery. So this is after surgery, you can see how inflamed. There were several pictures, but I didn't want to go too much in detail. So it was necrotic right in the middle, and of course, developed mucositis. With just four sessions of hyperbaric, you could see the next picture. It's very obvious. I mean, it did something. You see some healthy granulation tissue there. So we continued two additional treatments of, uh, of the thermal ablation and um, hyperbaric therapy, the mass completely regressed. There was no surgery needed. And the last picture, I had to create a pretty large flap uh, to close that uh, big uh, gap that formed once that mass was treated with, uh, with a thermal ablation. So in this, I mean, I mean, we are writing, this paper will probably come out pretty soon. We are writing this, uh, the focus is not hyperbaric therapy, it's cancer treatment but we supplemented hyperbaric therapy uh, to help us in the healing process. Um, this is a uh, scout. Uh, again, I think scout was seen in the hospital two or three years ago, uh, was diagnosed with Neospora canina in one of the local uh, referral hospitals. And they had referred scout up here for rehab. You know, so scout, uh, we did all the treatment options that we did. I mean, that's literally how uh, Scout came in uh, when we came to, so we did rehab, hyperbaric therapy, just to help Scout uh, recover from this um, Neospora canina. Poor prognosis was discussed. Scout could ba barely stand. I mean, you're looking at the videos there. Um, we did do the triple antibiotic therapy as well, uh, just to get that uh, Neospor out of there uh, with combined hyperbaric therapy. And the owners were very committed. They did not want to give up. Uh, this is called with, after a few sessions of hyperbaric and triple antibiotic therapy. And uh, that's called literally walking out of the hospital. And uh, like you know, with Neospora canina, you know, dogs are intermediate and can, sometimes can be definitely host. It causes paresis, paralysis, muscle wasting. 
And uh, it can, you know, when you have a whole bunch of oxygenation to the CNS, it has anti-inflammatory properties. With neurologic uh, issues, whether in the brain or spinal cord, even a little bit of inflammation, if you can settle that, you would see a, a pretty pronounced effect. But like I told you, hyperbaric therapy was combined with other treatment protocols. And Scout's owners were so grateful. Haley Nash, our ROVT, um, participated in the rehab. And, and they were so grateful. And I, like I said, I have several other cases, uh, but I think I'll stop right here. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I have a bunch of references if anyone is interested. And at this point, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask those questions. I'll answer those. So I, I see some questions here. Yes, so we have a couple of questions, Dr. Kishore. Um, first, I want to say, Dr. Kishore, thank you very much for your informative talk today. It, uh -huh. is, most, it is greatly appreciated. And I just want to add some, well, ask some questions that I feel sure. that the audience. Um, one of them is that, um, why do you need a four hour gap between sessions? So great question. There's several different reasons for that. The effects last um, a little longer. Than it, it's not something that just happens and goes away. So there's people that believe that the effects can last between one to four hours uh, after the treatment. Second, like I talked to you about oxygen toxicity, uh, if you increase frequency, increase the risk of seizures, you know, so that's the second reason that they really want a four hour uh, gap between sessions. And I see another question about, mm -hmm. can you accommodate giant breed dogs? Uh, the, I think I've done a 200 pound dog TPLO and I'm pretty sure uh, our TPLO, a 200 pound dog was able to go into the chamber and get hyperbaric therapy twice a day. So yes, no problems at all. Uh, we don't see compartment syndrome very often, like decompression illness, compression, uh, compartment syndrome. That's something that they treat in people. And that's why the hyperbaric th uh, uh, therapy first came into existence. They were treating divers, you know, if they would go deep sea diving. And, uh, and that's the was, uh, my understanding was one of the first indications of hyperbaric therapy. Uh, another question to you is what would be the cost of one treatment? So up here, I think we have packages. It's between eighty to one hundred and ten dollars uh, in 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 the U.S. Oklahoma City. You know, it could vary. So eighty dollars to one hundred and ten dollars. Okay, and I saw. Well, we saw that most of the um, cases that you presented with dogs, uh -huh. um, but cats can also be. Yeah. yeah okay. Great. Cats can be used as well. Uh, there was a couple publications that came out and said the safety for dogs and cats has been very well established. There's no questions of safe modality for dogs and cats. As far as treating specific conditions, that's what they're still working on. Okay. I'm just checking to see if we have any more questions sure. on the yeah. chat. So I'm not seeing any more questions. Sure. So I think that's it for today. Dr. Kishore, thank you very much for your talk with us today. And thank you, all the best in the future. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks a lot. Hey, that's it for today. We'll see you again soon for another lunchtime seminar.